Ja tota, nyt seuraavaksi me sit saadaan kuulla uh, Bridget Featherstonein uh, esitys, ja, ja tämän otsikkona on Towards Humane Organizations, Ethics of Care in Encountering Families with Intergenerational Psychosocial Problems. Ja, uh, Bridget, uh, uh, hänelle annettiin tämä otsikko, hän saattaa täh tähän vähän kommentoidakin, ja kirjassaan he on ihan kivalla tavalla myös jotenkin puhuneet siitä, että että minkälaisella kielellä ja käsitteellä me puhutaan ihmisten asioista, ja minkälainen kieli ja käsitteet olisi parempia kuin ehkä se, mihin ollaan totuttu. Ja tota noin, uh, unfortunately you haven't heard what we have been talking about, but you know, Eija's presentation brought up very many ideas from, the, from people who are here, and uh, Eija was talking about uh, how to recognize abuse and about the symptoms and all, all that. And then Mary is an uh, expert by experience, and she like told how she has been, what kind of experiences she has had with the service system, and how important it was for her to be heard and respected and so on. But you will go on from here. Ja nyt sanon sitten, että, että esitys on englanniksi, ja Bridget, you have promised to speak quite slowly, and you you also said that people can ask if, if, if they don't get everything that you, you're saying. Ja sitten mä sanon vielä, että me ollaan suomennettu uh, sekä Bridin että Keitin diasarjat, ja, ja sitten tämän seminaarin jälkeen me lähetetään teille ne suomennetut diat, mutta me ei pystytä nyt näyttämään niitä. Tässä oli ajatuksena, että oltaisiin näytetty suomenkieliset slaidit ja, ja englanninkieliset rinnakkain, mutta tekniikka ei nyt anna tähän myöten. Mutta hyvä, annetaan puheenvuoro Bridille. And maybe you can uh, tell a little bit about yourself in the beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, I will uh, try to speak slowly, but I'm actually from Ireland originally. And I don't know if you know, but the Irish got... I know. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm not from Cork, which is the worst bit. The, the southwest of Ireland, I, even I don't know what they're talking about. Um, Okay, uh, the, the, I work in England though, uh, and I'm a professor at Huddersfield, which is in the north of England. Does anybody know West Yorkshire? Useful countryside, the Pennines, lots of lovely walks. Uh, and both Kate and I are going to be talking a lot today about the work we've been doing, some of which was in this book, which we will talk about. I always worry about coming to uh, Scandinavia to Finland or, or Denmark. I've just been in Denmark actually for three days and I always worry about coming here uh, and in Copenhagen I was talking a lot to Swedish colleagues because what I'm going to talk about is so different from your experiences in some ways and I'm going to be talking about systems that are very very inhumane, systems that are very blaming of people and systems that are really, we think, failing, failing big time. And we know that that's not the reality for you at all, because you have, I know you are having some interesting political issues at the moment, and today actually is a very interesting day for you. I picked this up on Twitter last night. I was going, oh, <laughs> they may not have a government after today. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, um, I do know that the Nordic countries or the Scandinavian countries still aspire to a form of social democracy despite your political difficulties that we have really abandoned. We, we have a very different system. And also when I say we, I'm talking about England because Scotland is quite different, Wales is different, and Northern Ireland is a world of its own. It's very uh, on, very complicated what's happening in Northern Ireland. But very importantly and seriously, Scotland is trying to do things differently and more progressively. But England, sadly, is on a road of its own. However, having said that I think I'll be describing a world that's like on the moon, it's not quite, because I do know that we also do things in England that get transferred over. And I know, for example, Sweden has used some of our computer systems and used some of our ways of organizing uh, its organ uh, things that we think are terrible. So I do know that some of what I'll be saying will not be completely uh, unfamiliar to you. It'll have a lot of resonance. Okay, so how's, how's it going so far? Too fast? Okay, all right. Uh, right, so um, 
this, uh, this is the book that Sue Case, uh, Sue White, I don't know if people, she's done a lot of work on organisations and how you can make better organisations that are more people friendly. Uh, we wrote this book and was published last year, but of course the three of us have been doing work around uh, this for years, research around this. And we wrote the book because um, we felt that humane social work, that is social work that's about people working with other people and appreciating the fragility of the human condition, appreciating that we're all together on a very fragile planet uh, and that we all share common experiences around suffering and death and illness and vulnerability, that those possibilities had become more and more less for social work and that social work had become quite literally inhumane and we identified a number of issues. Uh, the first thing is, and I won't spend long on this because it's not the the uh, subject of today, but we have a very, I mean, neoliberalism is all over the world. It's not just in England. And features of it are, uh, as I can see, in Sweden and in Finland and in Norway, in the way in which the market has come into care. So neoliberalism isn't just English or US, but we have a very sharp feature of it. We do really believe the market is best, that the state is bad, that people are responsible for their own destiny, that if they're poor, it's their fault. It's because they don't work hard enough. If they get ill, they shouldn't really, despite our wonderful NHS, we are picking away at it. We're saying to people, really, you should take responsibility for your own destiny. And we felt that that had affected social work, that some of that had come into social work, that social workers were coming to see uh, the people they worked with as responsible. A very, very extreme example is uh, from one of uh, our colleagues' work. We found examples in London. London is now the second most expensive city in the world to live in. It is quite impossible for ordinary social workers to get a house in London, never mind people on minimum wage, uh, and to buy a house, rather. Uh, and we found social workers blaming fathers, uh, for not having suitable accommodation for their children and saying maybe that's something about your lack of commitment to your children or your attachment issues. So we found that social workers even, who should have a better perspective, were starting to imbibe this culture of blame. We also found that social workers were working in organisations that were obsessed with uh, the targets that they met, with the forms that they filled in, with the computer systems that they operated and to the extent that they were spending at least 70% of their time in front of the computer and the rest of the time visiting families. So that they would become very distanced from the families they were supposed to work with. The other thing is in the interest of efficiency, we found that social workers were often not working in the communities where their families lived, that they were based in offices that were many miles away. So what they did is they went out in their cars to visit families in communities that they didn't know very much about. And that's a problem when you're assessing for neglect. When you're assessing about why people are or aren't feeding their children properly, and you don't know how possible it is to find cheap food or good quality food, or how good the shops are, or how easy the transport system is, that is a problem. Because you then reduce it to or they're not feeding their children properly because they don't care about them, or they haven't got a good attachment to them. And what we were saying was, we need to look at the attachment problem. We're not saying attachment aren't, issues aren't uh, an issue. We're saying, though, look at the context in which people live. Is it easy for them to access good food? Is it easy for them to access local shops? What is happening to them? Do they have, when you go to their fridge, which our social workers do, and look to see, have they got enough food in the fridge? Is there enough food, is there not enough food in the fridge because they're drinking all the money or because they're not getting enough money to live on? So we're saying to people, ask all the questions. Don't ask just one question. Um, so, the, so we found our social workers were becoming more removed from families because we're a very unequal society uh, and people are more distanced from each other in an unequal society. We also found 
that they were more worried about doing the visit and ticking the box than what they did in the visit. So I, 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 uh, um, a man said to me recently who wants to do a PhD with me on engaging fathers, he said to me at the moment, I can be a good social worker and never see the parents because I just have to tick the box to say I saw the child. I saw the child every 10 days. Uh, we also found that there was a language of intervention rather than of help or support. And uh, Pavia said to me last night that our book is a lot about language. We think language is very important, and that's true. Because and the reason we don't like the language of intervention is that it implies the idea of an expert coming in from afar to treat the family. Now, sometimes that's important. There are some very difficult issues in families where you do need some therapeutic help, uh, very expert help. But a lot of the time, often what we need are people who will work alongside people and help them and support them to develop better lives. We thought as well, and this has been very controversial, this last bit, uh, or the sec this bit about the child. We've been accused of being against children's rights and of uh, wanting to turn the clock back. Let's be absolutely clear, children's rights and the focus on children's rights has been one of the great advances of the 20th century. We are totally in favour of children's rights. What we are not in favour of is seeing the child as an individual who has, who, whose connections with family, with kin, with community, with race, with identity are not respected. And in our system, sadly, they're not always respected anymore. The child is not even seen in the connection of their siblings. They're seen as an individual who must be rescued from these dreadful parents who are... <laughs> well, I, I don't know if that... that this is what we, I know we... Kate and I could tell you lots of stories about ministers who stood up and told us about these dreadful parents. Uh, who, uh, whose children need to be rescued. The finally, another point that we wanted to make in the book is that there, are, that you know, social work is a very gendered discipline. Lots of these professional disciplines are very gendered, and a focus on individual responsibility has different implications for men and women. All parents in our model are not seen as people in their own right. Neither men nor women are seen as people who have dreams, hopes, aspirations, who want lives for themselves as well as lives for their children. They're only seen in the context of are they doing this or that for their children. So what are the implications of their actions or inactions for their children? But of course, because it's highly gendered, women get a much worse deal. And so women, particularly in our system, who experience domestic abuse, often get a message from my research particularly, I'll pick this up, they get a message that it is their fault and that moreover they are harming their children by being beaten up because domestic abuse is bad for children. It's also very bad for everybody else. But uh, So we worried about the implications of a discourse that focuses on risk and responsibility. In the system, men end up being encoded with risk in one way, and women end up being encoded with responsibility. And that's problematic on both sides. Okay, so, so to be more positive, because the book is not just about what's wrong, we wanted to articulate and reimagine a different model. We wanted to say to the many people who go into social work because they want to make a difference, often many of them hate what they're doing. They get, we have very high rates of burnout and uh, we have retention issues. Uh, so many of our great students leave very shortly. Uh, the average length is about seven years. So we train people, very expensive training, and they leave after seven years. Uh, and that's the average, but lots of them leave after two or three. And we wanted to say there is another way. And so we looked, as, as you have identified in asking us to come and speak, we looked at the ethic of care, but also writings in the areas of relational welfare. Why did the ethic of care influence us? Incidentally, will you tell me the time? In terms of, yeah. Okay, okay, that's great. Thank you. The ethic of care influenced us because it's not perfect, uh, it, but it, it stresses our interdependence as human beings. It stresses our connections with each other. It stops what we call the them and us. 
And what we mean by the them and us is that there are people out there who are dependent, who don't get it together, who need help. And then there's the rest of us, independent, getting on with our lives, able to look after ourselves, hardworking, able to look after our families. We have a phrase in our English political system which drives me crazy. And the politicians of every uh, hue are always talking about hardworking families. We need to look after hardworking families. The thing is that in our system, the hardest working families are the people who are earning the least. They're the ones who are really struggling to survive. But of course, it would also be nice if they talked sometime about hard caring families. I mean, how hard it is to manage caring for your elderly parent alongside your young children, how hard it is to manage uh, a child with a disability, uh, how rewarding it is, but how hard it is as well. And so paid work has become the badge of responsible citizenship. And the ethic of care challenges that. It argues that we are human beings who, in order to survive from the day we are conceived to the day we are born, we are dependent upon each other. And that doesn't go away. All through life, we're interdependent. We need each other for food, for clothing, for love, for affection, uh, for recognition. Uh, indeed, the most profound need we have is for other people to recognize us as human. And as we have seen this summer across our television screens, we have seen uh, people crossing the oceans to come to different countries in Europe. And we have found, sadly, politicians trying to deny them their humanity, trying to deny that they're part of the same human species as us, because they don't want to take on the responsibility of caring and supporting them. So we wanted to offer a different ethic to the ethic that says there are some people over there who don't manage their lives well and we will offer them a short-term intervention. And in our case, it is ridiculous because we have parents with learning disabilities, parents who have long-term uh, learning problems, who are offered parenting programs endlessly when what they need is family support. They need help with getting the kids up in the morning, and it's, they're never going to get cured. They have learning disabilities. A parenting program is not what they need, a six-week parenting program. I met a parent with, parenting, uh, difficult, with learning difficulties recently who had had six parenting programs. She's not going to get better. She just needs some help to look after and love her children and care for her children. She loves them, but she needs some help. Uh, we thought it offered possibilities as well for hearing multiple voices and countering, as we say, the this, them and us. There are people who cope and there are people who can't. The ethic of care is about uh, all of us needing and giving care at different points of the life cycle. The human, be human beings are dependent from the moment they're conceived and we vary in terms of how much we need each other and what we need each other. But at any point, through a stroke, or through a car accident, we can all change from one status to another in a moment. We also thought, and the ethic of care is not the only ethic that um, does this, but it, uh, it's also in Judith Butler's work and Levinas's work, uh, it offered us the opportunity to rethink our responsibility towards each other and towards those who are distant strangers and to see the humanity behind the distance. Uh, this is a quote from John Tronto, which argues against the idea that care is about something that women do, or is something that we fit in in the evening after our really important work, our paid work, uh, that it's something that the least well-off people do. Uh, again, uh, you know, another horror story from England. Uh, our older people today receive, when they need care in their homes, uh, they will receive a, a, a maximum of, they may get three of these a day, but they, the market is now so dominant that the amount of time that they will have a care worker come to their home to bathe them or get them up or feed them is 15 minutes. That's all. They have 15 minutes and they don't even, the private firms don't even factor uh, the travel time into that. So, they, so lots of people who live in remote parts of England, in rural parts of England, can't get anyone to come because they can't afford the 
travel time. Um, it's often people who are new immigrants to the country, people who have very uh, little English, people who are really struggling to survive. And that shows the way in which care becomes not important. Care becomes secondary, if not even less than secondary. And we argue, the ethic of care says, we actually start from the assumption that we all need and receive care, not that we all need and receive work. And so it says it changes our assumptions about us as human beings, and it changes our assumptions about how society should be organized. I won't go into this, but there's lots of criticisms of the ethics of care. It has been used to say that women are morally superior to men because women do more caring. It has been used to promote a different, a particular kind of feminism, which is quite conservative. However, it has been a really, really significant uh, contributor to a shift in 20th century thought because it's moved thought away from the idea that our knowledge comes from sitting alone in a study, preferably if you're a man, and thinking great thoughts. It comes from, our knowledge comes from how we care for each other, what we learn through care. What the uh, our people who do uh, people who think about the ethic of care say it's the basis of citizenship. Through care we learn how to be attentive to each other. We learn how to hear each other. We learn how to anticipate each other's needs. We learn how to appreciate each other's differences as well as similarities. Through care we learn the great virtues and we are practiced the great virtues. Not through sitting alone and thinking great thoughts. That's not how knowledge is developed. It's developed through living with, working with, caring about each other. And it offers a different ethic to a neoliberal ethic, which is that you're on your own, you sink or swim in this grim world, and you look after yourself, and then you look after your family, and everybody else can go to hell. Um, through social work, uh, somebody like John Orm has been very important in thinking about it because it's challenged uh, the assumption that there are people who are cared for and there are people who provide care. It's challenged the assumption, again, of them and us. It's challenged the assumption that we social workers are something different to the people we care for and, the, that, and that there is something that, that, that unites us, which is, of course, our humanity. And Kate will talk about the latter, which is how it's been applied to family practices. Okay, so relational welfare. I gather some of you have had the TED talk. It's been sent around. Can, I would really emphasize if you haven't listened to the TED talk, it's Hilary Cotton talking about what she means by relational welfare. Basically, we see it as a critique of both a left and a right model of welfare. We see that both the left and the right uh, have developed models of welfare that are increasingly too businesslike and that turn uh, relationships between citizens and the state into relationships between consumers and, and in a business-like. So we think that that old lady can have a 15-minute visit because we, w we, think about the care, uh, we think about her care as a business. We don't think about the reality which is that maybe what she really needs um, is connection, is relationship, is something that's time rich. Uh, in the TED talk, Hilary Cottam talks about the research evidence that tells us that being lonely is worse for you in terms of your physical health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Loneliness and connection are at the heart of our physical and mental health and we need welfare services that build connections that stop loneliness. And unfortunately, we feel that our services, and I'll tell you about what some of our young people say in a minute, our services often cause loneliness. We tell women to leave violent men. I agree. As a feminist, of course, I agree. But I also don't agree with them being sent miles away from connections, from networks, from families, from communities, and, and then being asked to look after children on their own. We, we need to build, uh, and one of our themes in the book, which we're developing now in our new work, is we need to think beyond services. And we need to go back and think about how we help families, not just to come to us and to rely on us, but how we help people to build and sustain connections in communities. 
So in our new work, we're saying that we want job protection services that are not just about ringing up the social worker if you think a young mother isn't coping. That we want services that are supporting communities to care for that young mother, to support her, to offer uh, connections at a local level, and to stop this emphasis on a bureau bureaucratised, often very frightening system. So, intergenerational psychosocial problems. I was asked to think about this. And of course, when I read it, I thought, well, I don't even like that phrase. Uh, and, uh, and I thought, well, that's okay. I talked to Pavi last night about it, and I, we talked about the fact that we are using different kinds of language. The reason that I think language is important, and I think many people would probably agree, is language, if you think about things, in a, if you use different kinds of language, it opens up different possibilities. It opens up different ways of thinking about the world. So uh, if we think about intergenerational psychosocial problems in one way, which is often how our services think about them, we think about them in terms of things being passed down. Multi-problem families who have histories of problems and they pass them down through the generation. So you have grandmas, mothers and children. And in fact, people who experience services say to me that's often how they feel they're treated. But actually, if you can also think about people who have had histories of pain, hurt and deprivation that have not been dealt with. And also, we think that we have, in England anyway, intergenerational systems failures. We have, in, we have and I will give you an example of this. This is a, a really very... Jenny, it's not her real name, but Jenny stood up at a conference just like this one in front of people like you uh, in June in London at a conference that I was involved in. And she was very quietly spoken and the tears were very near all the time through what she said. And she talked about the fact that when she was 12, she was placed in care because she was psychologically damaged. That was the assessment. She'd been emotionally ne neglected by her mother. She talked about the fact, though, that when she was 20, her baby was removed from her because she was too psychologically damaged to parent the baby. And as she looked around at a group like you, there were more lawyers as well, and she said, why weren't my psychological difficulties dealt with? Why wasn't I helped with the problems I had? And why is it now being repeated through the generations? Why, you know, am I... And, and she isn't unknown. We have, um, oh, I can't remember the exact statistic, we have lots of young people that we take into care and we don't deal with properly and then we take their children away from them. Now who's failing there? Is it as simple as they're passing down the problems? And we would argue that it's not as simple. And again, going back to, you know, the why we wrote the book, we partly wrote the book because we found children who were in care in our system who were experiencing, and this is honestly the truth, a little boy who by the time he was six had had 23 social workers. 23 social workers. And we think that that's got to stop because one of the reasons our social workers leave is because they don't like working in this kind of system and we have to find a more humane system for them to work in. So everybody is a loser in Jenny's story. Her baby, Jenny, and the systems. Just, but just to go back to the thing. So um, one of the things we've done uh, a lot of is looking at uh, the research that's been done with people who live in poverty around how they manage uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and where we found that people really got into trouble and really ended up with uh, really, um, and it was very complicated. It was interactional rather than causal. Things interacted with each other rather than caused each other or caused each other. So we found people who hadn't enough to live on uh, because the benefit system is so punitive, who had children who who had children who were demanding quite a lot from them as they got older, because we live in a very consumerist society. So we often found women who had, their children were their, were their, were their main source of love, respect, connection. These women didn't have fancy jobs. 
They didn't have great big careers. They didn't have great other sources of uh, recognition. What they did have was their status as a mother. And I, when a child is young, that is less under threat. But as children get older and start saying, I want this, I want that, I want the other, women were finding the lack of respect, the demands, very hard to cope with. And so you had women who were really struggling to parent well in those kind of contexts. What we also had, though, were the women who got into most trouble were women who themselves had had mothers who had struggled and who had had uh, relationships that were often violent that were not dealt with. And, and but the shame as well, what we also found was that, again, it's interactive. Women who had multiple issues, lack of money, the shame of not getting it together, of not doing well, meant that they cut themselves off from sources of support. Because that's the other thing. The, the things that are really bad for us all are when we have no one to talk to, we haven't got enough money to ask someone to come into the house. We're ashamed of what it looks like. We haven't got the money to go out and buy a cup of coffee. and. Because what you're buying with the cup of coffee is a break and also the possibility of talking to somebody else and feeling just for a little bit of time a bit nurtured. And the people who were getting into most trouble were the people who weren't, a, who had none of those kinds of resources. You know, I often talk to my middle class friends about particularly women uh, with children who say, I buy myself out of trouble. You know, I manage my life by buying some help here or buying some time there. And we were finding women who were really struggling to buy themselves out of trouble and who were stuck with histories of pain, with histories of hurt, with histories of men who had not treated them well, and with histories then of I'm the kind of person that bad things happen to. So it isn't intergenerational psychosocial problems, but it is histories of pain, of hurt, of disappointment that our systems often exacerbate because we, we reproduce loneliness, we reproduce rupture. Um, if we look at one terrible example is um, when we take a child away from their parents in England, there is no statutory obligation to offer support to a mother. So Jenny, at the age of 22, is a member of, it has been through our system. We, we should have some form of responsibility towards her, but we don't actually. Once she gets to a certain age, she goes from being a child that we are responsible for to a mother who's a risk to her child. And then we have no responsibility to her to offer her support when her child is removed. We have increasing evidence of birth mothers losing their children in sequence. 50% of those mothers have been in care themselves. 50% of them are losing two or more children before the age of 20. System failure or intergenerational psychosocial problems. Uh, we have, and this is a quote from somebody uh, professional, if you take a child away from this natural family and we haven't looked at effective treatments we, that could reasonably be made available, then we fail as a society. In fact, we go further in the book and we say, because we take away children in our society from the most deprived people in our society, and because we are increasingly not offering them the kind of family support they need, we argue it's a complete ethical failure and that we need to look at it as a society. Now, we have a particular problem in England, which is adoption. Uh, adoption is available in many countries. Uh, and adoption without birth parent consent is available in many countries. But it's not that well used. And, but in England now, it's part of our policy narrative. Our Prime Minister this week stood up in, and said, I want more adoptions and I want them faster. I want the systems to stop failing. Uh, I want more, I want to hurry up the numbers of adoptions. Uh, and this is uh, from uh, a very wonderful woman who runs an adoption charity. She's an adoptive parent herself. And she uh, talks about our history. It was born in the 18th century. It was very imbued with the Christian ethics at the time. It was seen as charitable. It was seen as a good thing to change children's names, to separate siblings. Some mothers would lose more than one child and would be left unaware. Uh, we then had, in later years, uh, children shipped off to Australia and Canada. There was no contact, and as we know, people have been have, have kind of spent their lives searching. Uh, but reunification very rarely happened. This was what used to happen. Of course, it's all in the past, isn't it? And 
but it's not. Of course it's not. And what we're having now in England are two narratives going on at the same time, which is dizzying and confusing. We have the Prime Minister saying, we must rescue these children, we must take them away from these neglectful parents, and we must give them to new people, new parents, who will create them, uh, you know, as new beings in a way. And, uh, and uh, it, this is a risk-free panacea. It's a win-win on the one hand. On the other hand, we have increasing numbers of adult adoptees telling their story. Telling, even when the adoption was a successful one, even when they absolutely love their adoptive parents, they're saying to us, I lost things. I lost a sense of connection with identity, with class, with my race even. Uh, with um, I lost a whole history. And there, and so it's extraordinary. So we had a national adoption week uh, two weeks ago where uh, massive amounts of money. We have no money for family support anymore. We have no money for our children's centres, all been cut. But we have millions for adoption. And we had government minister after government minister standing up during adoption week talking about the importance of adoption and the importance of rescuing these children and putting them with good parents. We had not one single adult abductee on any of those platforms. They had to organise their own event. So, intergenerational psychosocial problems or what's going on? So let's talk about what children and young people say to us. And Kate and I were both involved in something called the Care Inquiry. This happened uh, about three years ago, or four years ago, uh, when the adoption narrative started to really be strong. I mean, it's been around for 20 years, but it started to be really strong. So we organized this inquiry, and we got everybody together. We got birth parents, we got adoptive parents, we got foster parents, we got, uh, gov we didn't get any government ministers, but we got very senior civil servants, and everyone got into the same room uh, over a three-day period. We also uh, got children and young people to spend some time on their own developing a presentation which they delivered to us at the end of the three days. And they stood up, again like here, and they told us, we said the, the task that was set was, you know, what kind of system would you like? And they told us that we had built a system for them that was all about saying goodbye. That every time they moved, they said goodbye to really important people in their lives. And it could be the foster parent's boyfriend, or it could be the foster parent's neighbor, or it could be the foster parent's cousin. And they, what they said to us was, stop, stop creating a system that's about saying goodbye. We need more people in our lives, not less. And they said to us, we can manage mess, you know. It's you who can't manage mess. We can manage, and many of them, many of them were for London, many of them were a very, very mixed identity. So we had extraordinarily uh, interesting combinations. Uh, young women who were Swedish, Iranian, uh, women who were from, uh, who had all sorts of uh, complicated ethnic backgrounds. And they said, our passports are, trick are messy, our emotional lives are messy, that's all right. Stop trying to put us in boxes. Stop trying to say, I'm a, an adoptee, or, and I'm not a birth parent, child. I'm a mother. I'm not a, a, a needy child. Let us have our complex identities and build your systems around our identities. So let us build systems that respect and repair rather than rupture. Let's, let's multiply sources of support for families and let's stop having systems and services that are about boxes. So you're 10 years of age, you're in this team, you're with this social worker. Then you become 11, you're in this team, you're with that kind of social worker. Um, I'm a foster parent myself and we've uh, just had a a uh, very difficult uh, experience with one of our young people, who has a young girl who's got pregnant. And it was very difficult to sit her down recently and say to her, do you know, when that baby is born, I just want to tell you, I'm a social worker by background. I hate to say this about my own profession, but I said, the social workers aren't going to give a shit about you when that baby is born. They're only going to be worried about the baby. So look after yourself and look after the baby and bear that in mind, that once you, once you have that baby, 
You are a mother who might be a risk to a child. You're no longer a looked after child with your own needs and vulnerabilities. And she looked at me, she's at the age where she thinks everything I say is a complete pile of nonsense. So she didn't listen, but, uh, which is a shame actually, because I, in one instance I wasn't talking nonsense. I might talk nonsense about lots of things, but this is one I did know where I was, what I was talking about. And I fear she's going to learn the hard way that our system only deals with one bit of you. And because, and this is one thing we got into trouble about in the book as well, we were very critical about the way in which our social workers walked into families and said, I'm only here for the child. I'm only here to make sure the child is all right. Uh, and we challenged social workers to say, how do you think children feel about this? When they see you treat their parents with such instrumental approach, when you say to when you say to the parents, have you got enough food? Uh, are you going to the class? Did you get to the parenting group last week? Uh, you know, when we, when, when, what do you think the children say about this? What do you think they think about how you're treating their parents? Because sadly, again, going back to how it all works together, because they feed the computers so much, because they feed the audit system so much, they haven't got much time. So often they go in and they go, did you do this? Did you do that? Is he gone? Uh, you know, we call it the finger wagging thing. It's not nice. It's not comfortable for anyone. The social workers hate doing it, except the ones who have become completely socialized into it now and think that that's their job. But a lot of them don't. The older ones absolutely hate it. The younger ones hate it. There's a group in the middle who sadly are institutionalized and think that that's what social work is about. As one said to us when we did a training program on engaging fathers recently, uh, we were trying to introduce ideas around motivational interviewing. And she looked at us with amusement and she said, but if I'm not telling them what to do, what's my job? Oh yeah, well. Anyway, so, um, so, so I think when we talk to children and young people, I know this as a foster parent myself, they do want us, even when they're very angry with their parents, they do want us to have done the best we can to make sure that we support them. And we, and we do need to be able, again, when we've been thinking about system failure, we have been thinking about time in a very careful way. We hear a lot about time. You must get the children out early because their brains will be damaged if you don't. We use neuroscience a lot. It's very, very deterministic. You must get the children out early because their attachment patterns will be damaged. But we think of time in a different way. We think, as has happened, we think about the children and young people who have said to us, we want to talk to the social worker who took us away from our parents 10 years ago. We want to talk to them about what happened. We want to make sense of it. And so we say to social workers, make sure that you have a good story to tell those children. Think about that. Think about that for the future. So finally, let's look at Ella's story. And let's look at what a humane organization might look like in terms of, uh, and this very much feeds into themes that um, Kate will be developing uh, further. This is from uh, uh, Hilary Cottom's work. And she tells a story. Did anyone watch the TED Talk? Yeah, the Ella story, yeah. And she tells the story of Ella. Ella had had endless social workers. Her family had endless social workers. They came in droves to her house. They spent endless time talking to each other about Ella and her problems. Uh, they spent a lot more time talking to each other, filling in forms, going to meetings with each other than they actually did with Ella. And as she said, when they looked at the time, um, she, they found um, that 86% of the time the workers had was spent meeting the demands of the system. 14% of the time was sitting having conversations with Ella. And even when they were having conversations with Ella and her family, the conversations were dictated to by the forms. Have you been to the job centre? Have you been to this? Have you been to that? So they weren't really proper exploratory conversations. So Hillary um, set up an or she set up a number of different organisations. One actually is an organisation that works with older people around loneliness. But in this case, this is this is uh, an organisation that was set up to work with so-called troubled families, families that were seen as having multiple problems. And um, uh, uh, Hillary's organisation, uh, they they go and live in the community where the family where the family lives. 
not forever, but for a brief time. We used to do it in social work. We used to call it patch-based social work. We used to believe in community-based social work. We used to believe that in order to understand what was happening to people, we needed to have an understanding of where they lived, how they lived, and have a sense of what it was like for them to live there. So the workers go and sit alongside Ella as the housing manager comes to see her, as the police come in, and they get a feel of what it's like to be Ella in her family. They also talk to Ella about what she wants and needs and find some resources for Ella. And crucially, actually, which is very interesting, uh, Ella gets, the, gets to choose, out of all the workers, she gets to choose who she really wants to work with. And the interesting thing is that nine times out of ten, uh, Ella and people like Ella choose someone who's tough, who is not a soft cop, but who, talk, who doesn't talk in jargon and who, does, who, know, who admits they don't know everything. They haven't got the answers to everything. We get endless, endless uh, complaints from families about the jargon the social workers use. Endless complaints about the fact that they don't understand what people are talking about and that they want them to talk in a straight and fair way to them. Ella was offered the opportunity to exercise choice not only over the worker, but also she was offered a pot of money to spend how she wanted. And, uh, and families like Ella have chosen all sorts of things. To have a day away as a family, to paint a room, or to do something different. So what a humane organisation starts to look like is that the family is at the heart of it. Not the forms, not the computer, and not the workers. And that we think... Certainly this happened in Participle. We think that, that in the book we talk about how if you start from the families and you recognise the importance of looking after their relational needs, then you do then bring that back into the ethos of the office. So you look after the social workers' relational needs. Because, and this is my final point, we have social workers who go out to visit families and tell them off and tell them what they should and shouldn't be doing. Those same social workers go back to offices where they don't have a desk anymore, they're hot desking, where they don't have necessarily colleagues anymore because everybody is working virtually. It's more efficient, you see, saves you a lot of money. Uh, and uh, as an organization, uh, you know, those big blocks of flats in the middle of town are fantastic, but they're not conducive to relationships or connections. So the social workers aren't having their relational needs met either. So if they're not having their relational needs met, how can they meet the relational needs of families? And I think that's it. Thank you very much for listening. I do, in the, in the interest of fairness, can I just say that it isn't that people are rebelling against this. And we do have local authorities, Kate is working in one at the minute, that are trying very hard to develop what's called restorative approaches, relational based approaches. The people are really trying. It's very hard in a risk based, risk averse society though, where the minute a social worker makes a mistake, the politicians, the same politicians jump on them. So, but we are trying to change it. Thank you very much, Brid. And stay here. I, I'm sure that people will want to uh, talk a little bit about everything that you've said. Ja nyt tosiaan niin meillä on aikaa ennen ruokataukoa 15 minuuttia ja me voidaan ihan hyvin nyt käyttää sitä keskusteluun ja, ja puheenvuoroja saa esittää suomeksi ja voidaan yrittää kääntää, mutta voitte tietysti myös, myös puhua englanniksi. Ja, ja toivottavasti tämä kieli, kieli oli ihan ok ja, ja oli, oli sillä tavalla seurattavissa, mutta so we'll, we'll have 15 minutes until lunch and I think that we could use that time to discuss a little. Kiitos hyvästä puheenvuorosta. Thank you for that information. It was very interesting. Olen isät lasten asialla rystä ja tosiaan tuossa joku aiemmin nosti puheenvuoron tuota esiin tästä lasten vieraanottamisesta, sen ilmiöstä ja, ja tieteellisyydestä on nyt viime vuodet paljon puhuttu ja itse asiassa tieteellistä tutkimustahan nyt aiheesta tullut, joten me täällä ollaan sitten kommentoimassa sitä asiaa osittain, että, että saataisiin se tähän lastensuojeluagendalle mukaan, koska moni asia, niin kuin tiedätte, lastensuojeluongelmista juontaa juurensa erovanhemmuudesta. Ja itse asiassa lasten vieraannuttaminen on, on sen verran heikosti tunnettu vielä Suomen maassa, että tota, siihen ei oikeastaan ole menetelmiä vielä kehitetty. 
ja, ja tota sitä, sitä työtä me ollaan osaltamme tekemässä, että saataisiin siihen semmoisia järkeviä toimintamalleja se tulisi vakavasti huomioon otettuksi asiaksi, kuten tulisi olla vakava lapseen kohdistuva väkivallan, henkisen väkivallan muoto. Et hyvin usein se selitetään huotoriidaksi tai muuta, muuta jolloin sille ei itse asiassa voi tehdä mitään, mutta näin ei tulisi siis olla. Okei, mä haluaisin kysyä puhujalta, että kuinka Britanniassa on tämä lasten vieraanottaminen otettu lastensuojelutyöhön? Okay, so he, he is from an organization, uh, Fathers on behalf of children, and he would like to know how uh, child protection in England is relating to this phenomenon of alienation when people get divorced. And I'm sure you know, know the phenomenon. Yes. Um, well, I mean, we've got what's called private law and public law. So it, public law is where uh, it's uh, public law is where there are concerns about children and child protection and whether parents are doing or not doing certain things to their children. And private law is around divorce and contact and the things that happen uh, when uh, people split up. Uh, I mean, the question of alienation, uh, because we're very uh, child and I mean. I think we're equal opportunities in terms of our suspicion of parents, actually. I think we're equal opportunities into suspicion in the sense of we don't discriminate. Let me think about how... We... we the, I don't think the child protection system deals very much with what they call... I think you're talking about parental alienation. Yeah, it doesn't really deal with that. That would be dealt with more in private law. What the best people, I think, recognize that there are situations where either mothers or fathers uh, use children in battles against each other. And so children become very harmed and very alienated in those processes. Uh, so I think um, there is no evidence, despite the fact that some of the fathers' organizations really still feel there is, there is no evidence that, that fathers are being discriminated against in the public law system. Aren't mothers. Both, yeah. Yeah, we do, we do, I don't think it's very well developed, but we do recognize that children get very, very badly treated in very high conflict situations, yes, and that there is something called alienated children children who are alienated, who are caught in the middle of battles, and it's extremely bad for them. I mean, myself, I've used the work of uh, Kelly in the, from the US and people like that, because I don't like the parental alienation stuff. I, I don't think that's methodologically rigorous. I don't, but I do think that children get alienated. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that's a form of emotional abuse. No need. And the sit then. I'm Kim Moarnio. Hi. Uh, your lecture was excellent. And in Finland, uh, there has been uh, some uh, discussion about making the adoption as permanent after two years of, of taking into, into some uh, um, uh, temporary adoption. And, and uh, uh, to my understanding, this discussion has been uh, brought up by the uh, uh, substitute uh, families yes. who somehow want to keep those kids that they have got. And uh, according to one study in Finland, one third of the substitute families have taken the kid because they haven't got their biological kids for some, some reason of themselves. So they substitute their unborn kid with the kid that they take through adoption. So in Finland, we have had this discussion that is born by the uh, substitute families. And uh, no one has criticized those discussions. They have somehow uh, 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 said that, okay, they have uh, been silent. No one has criticized that. So I think uh, 
what do you think about this kind of, of uh, direction in Finland? Yeah, um, the thing about adoption is it's, it's extremely permanent. You know, you, all the rights of the birth parent are completely transferred over to the adoptive parents. Even if, as has happened, we have found that the evidence that was used against the birth parents, so for example, you know where um, children have been, babies have been fought, found with really bad bruises and really bad injuries, and it's been assumed that it was caused by the parents, the birth parents, and then later medical evidence has shown that it wasn't, that actually it was to do with a particular form of illness or bone thing. The adoption even then cannot be reversed, it's done. So, so first of all, it's terribly permanent. Uh, but the second thing is, uh, it's the closed nature of our adoption system. There is some openness, but it's really at the level of you can send a birthday card or a Christmas card. So what we're saying is it literally is the transfer of a child from one situation to another. And our point is what those young people said to us. Why can't we have because we, we're not saying that all children can live with their birth parents. We're absolutely not saying that. We know that that's, we've all been social workers. We know the harm that people can do. What we are saying is, though, that children, particularly as they grow up, we have a lot of problems in adolescence with our adoptive children. There is huge issues, huge conflicts and trauma. We even have a lot of child-to-parent violence, actually, in adolescence. And some of that is... Oh, a lot of it is being put down to, oh, they were neglected when they were young, or there's something wrong with their brains. But I actually think some of it is about identity. Some of it is about them searching for things at that age. So what we're saying is we need more open, uh, or more oh, permanency, children being happy and he healthy and settled with one person, knowing where their home is, is desirable, totally desirable. But why can't they have the connections that they need with the rest of their family and their birth families. Why can't we manage that? And adoptees don't like that. They find adoptive parents really struggle. Not all, but some really struggle with that. See, we have an option called special guardianship, which gives the adoptive, uh, gives the foster parents or the substitute carers legal powers. They have the legal powers, they, but they just don't have. It's not as kind of like rigid as the adoption. So we're saying, why do you need to have a closed adoption? Why do you need to have the child just to be your own? What so, why can't you accept that they have another identity and history? Why is that so frightening and threatening? Because that's what it is about, in my view. So we have to say, if we're really, really child-centered, my friend, is a, she works with uh, where there are adoption breakdowns. And, you know, the figures are very disputed over how much adoption breakdowns there are. Uh, because a lot of the time when the kids get a bit older, they just go anyway. So it doesn't come up in the figures. It doesn't feature in the statistics. So we don't really know, but the latest are maybe about 15% are breakdowns, which is a lot less than we thought. But there's an incredible amount of conflict. So my friend who's a, a social worker in this kind of area, she says to me, we really, really need to think about what child-centeredness means because what she often finds is battles between the adopters who, are, who have certain kinds of needs, and the social workers. And actually, the child and what they want is not always featuring in those discussions. We need to hear what adoptees are thinking, particularly as they get older. And what they generally seem to be saying to us is, oh, you know, we need to make sense of our birth. You know, in, in our lives, generally, you know, I don't know if you have these programs in Finland, but we have programs where people go back to search for their family trees and, you know, uh, celebrities, you know, film stars, and they're always going back to see where they came from. It's part, it seems to be, a, because our postmodern world is so complex and, you know, so unstable, we're all searching for where we really came from, and it's really an important human thing. Why would we expect children who are adopted not to want to do that? They do. They do want to do it. And we need to be able to respect it and support it. And we need to support adopters to do it as well. This closed adoption is too problematic. We think, and I don't know if Kate, I think Kate agrees with me and she might talk about it, we think we're building up a lot of problems with our current social policies. We think that, you know how in Australia and indeed in Ireland, people had to go back and apologise to unmarried mothers and they had to apologise to Aboriginal communities about what was done. We think we will be in that position in 20 years' time. We really do. Okay.
Nyt mä annan vielä yhden puheenvuoron Tiinalle tuolla kohta, mutta sanon tässä vielä väliin, että meillä tosiaan sen jälkeen alkaa sitten lounas. Ja lounas, lippuja saa ostaa vielä tuosta rappujen alapäästä siinä ruokajonossa seistessä, ne jotka ei vielä ehtineet. Ja sitten kaikki puheenvuoron pitäjät ja panelistit voi kertoa nimensä kassalle ja saa sieltä sitten ilmaisen lounaslipun. Mutta nyt mä annan vielä Tiinalle päättävän puheenvuoron. Kiitos. My name is Tiina Moka and thank you for a brilliant lecture. It was very good. I heard about the blaming culture in spring in, in Scotland the first time, and now you're talking about it. And just a small question, what can we do to change it? Uh, it's, a, it's, a good, it's a very small question, isn't it? But it's a, 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 Kate and I are involved in a piece of research. Uh, it's quite a big piece of research by, a, 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 in, 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 in our standards, uh, where we're looking at um, the relationship between where you live and your chances of coming into care. You know, and we all, because, surprise, surprise, our government doesn't collect data on the social and economic circumstances of the families that it removes children from. So when it makes statements like these children who go into these kind of placements have great outcomes, we, it never controls for social and economic circumstances. So it's very unfair research. But anyway, uh, so I've been trying to think about how we are going to get different messages out there. Because rationally, you see, the thing is that when people don't listen to the facts. You can have all the good facts you like. Rationally, England is a really safe place to grow up if you're worried about being killed by your parents. Our figures are fantastic, and they're in long-term decline. It is, I mean, it's something like 1.2 per million. You know, it's really, really very low chance of you getting killed by your parents. However, compared to Sweden, I don't know about Finland, but it's Sweden is the, uh, is the figure I picked up on. If you look comparatively at your chances of dying before you're five due to an accident or due to uh, lead or poisoning or asbestos or any of those things that are associated with danger or, or, uh, or uh, deprivation, five, five children a day more in England die than in Sweden. So actually it's a really bad place to grow up in if you're poor or deprived. So we want to talk to them. We're, we're trying to do a couple. Of, we're trying to get those facts across to politicians. The other thing we're trying to do um, is, which is really difficult but really important, is to try and reduce the social distance between families and politicians. To try and get politicians to engage with people as human beings and to stop them seeing them as other. Do you know what I mean? Because if they really do have this vision of these people who are deliberately neglecting their children, uh, then it is very hard to summon up human sympathy because we all want to protect children, don't we? And we see these images of these children who are innocent and, uh, you know, uncorrupted. And then we see their dreadful parents, allegedly. And uh, it's very easy to get really furious. A lot of our politicians are reasonably young. They have young children themselves. So they, they go into this thing about, as a parent myself. So we're trying to, we think we need to try and reduce social distance, that it won't be enough to give them facts. But we do need to give them the facts as well. Because actually, our child protection system is extremely safe. But is it healthy? Is it a good place for people to grow up in? Is it a good place to work in? There are different criteria. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much again. You, well, maybe we should applaud again. Ja, nyt meillä on tosiaan...